since independence by NCERT forward the National Curriculum Framework, NCF 2005 recommends that children's life at school must be linked to their life outside the school. This principle marks a departure from the legacy of bookish learning which continues to shape our system and causes a gap between the school, home and community. Forward. The National Curriculum Framework, NCF, 2005 recommends that children's life at school must be linked to their life outside the school. This principle marks a departure from the legacy of bookish learning which continues to shape our system and causes a gap between the school, home and community. The syllabi and textbooks developed on the basis of NCF signify an attempt to implement this basic idea. They also attempt to discourage road learning and the maintenance of sharp boundaries between different subject areas. We hope these measures will take us significantly further in the direction of a child-centered system of education outlined in the National Policy on Education, 1986. The success of this effort depends on the steps that school principals and teachers will take to encourage children to reflect on their own learning and to pursue imaginative activities and questions. We must recognize that, given space, time and freedom, children generate new knowledge by engaging with the information passed on to them by adults. Treating the prescribed textbook as the sole basis of examination is one of the key reasons why other resources and sites of learning are ignored. Inculcating creativity and initiative is possible if we perceive and treat children as participants in learning, not as receivers of a fixed body of knowledge. These aims imply considerable change in school routines and mode of functioning. Flexibility in the daily timetable is as necessary as rigor in implementing the annual calendar so that the required number of teaching days are actually devoted to teaching. The methods used for teaching and evaluation will also determine how effective this textbook proves for making children's life at school a happy experience, rather than a source of stress or boredom. Syllabus designers have tried to address the problem of curricula burden by restructuring and reorienting knowledge at different stages with greater consideration for child psychology and the time available for teaching. The textbook attempts to enhance this endeavor by giving higher priority and space to opportunities for contemplation and wondering. Discussion in small groups and activities requiring Hansen experience. NCERT appreciates the hard work done by the Textbook Development Committee responsible for this book. We wish to thank the chairperson of the Advisory Group on Social Science, Professor Hari Vasudevan and the chief advisors for this book, Sri Yojendra Yadav and Professor Sahash Paul Shikhar for guiding the work of this committee. Several teachers contributed to the development of this textbook. We are grateful to their principles for making this possible. We are indebted to the institutions and organizations which have generously permitted us to draw upon their resources, material and personnel. We are especially grateful to the members of the National Monitoring Committee, appointed by the Department of Secondary and Higher Education, Ministry of Human Resource Development under the chairpersonship of Professor Marinal Miri and Professor G. P. Desh Pandey, for their valuable time and contribution. As an organization committed to systemic reform and continuous improvement in the quality of its products, NCERT welcomes comments and suggestions which will enable us to undertake further revision and refinement. 
In this chapter, the first few years in the life of independent India were full of challenges. Some of the most pressing ones concerned national unity and territorial integrity of India. We begin the story of politics in India since independence by looking at how three of these challenges of nation-building were successfully negotiated in the first decade after 1947. Freedom came with partition, which resulted in large-scale violence and displacement and challenged the very idea of a secular India. The integration of the princely states into the Indian Union needed urgent resolution. The internal boundaries of the country needed to be drawn afresh to meet the aspirations of the people who spoke different languages. In the next two chapters we shall turn to other kinds of challenges faced by the country in this early phase. Chapter 1 Challenges of Nation Building At the hour of midnight on 14-15 August 1947, India attained independence. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of Free India, addressed a special session of the Constituent Assembly that night. This was the famous, tryst with destiny, speech that you are familiar with. This was the moment Indians had been waiting for. You have read in your history textbooks that there were many voices in our national movement. But there were two goals almost everyone agreed upon. One, that after independence, we shall run our country through democratic government. And two, that the government will be run for the good of all, particularly the poor and the socially disadvantaged groups. Now that the country was independent, the time had come to realize the promise of freedom. This was not going to be easy. India was born in very difficult circumstances. Perhaps no other country by then was born in a situation more difficult than that of India in 1947. Freedom came with the partition of the country. The year 1947 was a year of unprecedented violence and trauma of displacement. It was in this situation that independent India started on its journey to achieve several objectives. Yet the turmoil that accompanied independence did not make our leaders lose sight of the multiple challenges that faced the new nation. Three challenges broadly, independent India faced three kinds of challenges. The first and the immediate challenge was to shape a nation that was united, yet accommodative of the diversity in our society. India was a land of continental size and diversity. Its people spoke different languages and followed different cultures and religions. At that time it was widely believed that a country full of such kinds of diversity could not remain together for long. The partition of the country appeared to prove everyone's worst fears. There were serious questions about the future of India, would India survive as a unified country? Would it do so by emphasizing national unity at the cost of every other objective? Would it mean rejecting all regional and subnational identities? And there was an urgent question, how was integration of the territory of India to be achieved? The second challenge was to establish democracy. You have already studied the Indian Constitution. You know that the Constitution granted fundamental rights and extended the right to vote to every citizen. India adopted representative democracy based on the parliamentary form of government. These features ensure that the political competition would take place in a democratic framework. A democratic constitution is necessary but not sufficient for establishing a democracy. The challenge was to develop democratic practices in accordance with the constitution. The third challenge was to ensure the development and well-being of the entire society and not only of some sections. 
Here again the Constitution clearly laid down the principle of equality and special protection to socially disadvantaged groups and religious and cultural communities. The Constitution also set out in the directive principles of state policy the welfare goals that democratic politics must achieve. The real challenge now was to evolve effective policies for economic development and eradication of poverty. How did independent India respond to these challenges? To what extent did India succeed in achieving the various objectives set out by the Constitution? This entire book is an attempt to respond to these questions. The book tells the story of politics in India since independence so as to equip you to develop your own answers to big questions like these. In the first three chapters we look at how the three challenges mentioned above were faced in the early years after independence. In this chapter, we focus on the first challenge of nation-building that occupied Centre Stage in the years immediately after independence. We begin by looking at the events that formed the context of independence. This can help us understand why the issue of national unity and security became a primary challenge at the time of independence. We shall then see how India chose to shape itself into a nation, united by a shared history and common destiny. This unity had to reflect the aspirations of people across the different regions and deal with the disparities that existed among regions and different sections of people. In the next two chapters we shall turn to the challenge of establishing a democracy and achieving economic development with equality and justice. Today I call war as Shah Amrita Pritam today, I call war as Shah, speak from your grave, and turn, today, the book of love's next affection at page once, a daughter of Punjab cried and you wrote a wailing saga today, a million daughters, cry to you, war as Shah rise. Oh, narrator of the grieving, rise. Look at your Punjab today, fields are lined with corpses, and blood fills the chin of someone has mixed poison in the five rivers flow their deadly water is, now, irrigating our lands galore this fertile land is sprouting, venom from every pore the sky is turning red from endless cries of gore the toxic forest wind, screams from inside its wake turning each flute's bamboo shoot, into a deadly snake, translation of an extract from a Punjabi poem, A.A.J. Akhan Waris Shah Nath. Amrita Pritam, 1919 to 2005, a prominent Punjabi poet and fiction writer, recipient of Sahitya Academy Award, Padma Shri and Janapith Award. After partition, she made Delhi her second home. She was active in writing and editing Nagman I, a Punjabi monthly magazine till her last we have a Muslim minority who are so large in numbers that they cannot, even if they want, go anywhere else. That is a basic fact about which there can be no argument. Whatever the provocation from Pakistan and whatever the indignities and horrors inflicted on non-Muslims there, we have got to deal with this minority in a civilized manner. We must give them security and the rights of citizens in a democratic state. If we fail to do so, we shall have a festering sore which will eventually poison the whole body politic and probably destroy it. Jawaharlal Nehru, Letter to Chief Ministers, the 15th of October 1947. Partition, displacement and rehabilitation on 14-15 August 1947, not one but two nation-states came into existence India and Pakistan. This was result of patrician the division of British India into India and Pakistan. The drawing of the border demarcating the territory of each country marked the culmination of political developments that you have read about in the history textbooks. According to their Twanation theory, advanced by the Muslim League, India consisted of not one but two people, Hindus and Muslims. That is why it demanded Pakistan, a separate country for the Muslims. 
The Congress opposed this theory and the demand for Pakistan. But several political developments in 1940s, the political competition between the Congress and the Muslim League and the British role led to the decision for the creation of Pakistan. Process of partition thus it was decided that what was till then known as India would be divided into two countries, India and Pakistan. Such a division was not only very painful, but also very difficult to decide and to implement. It was decided to follow. Principle of religious majorities. This basically means that areas where the Muslims were in majority would make up the territory of Pakistan. The rest was to stay with India. The idea might appear simple, but it presented all kinds of difficulties. First of all, there was no single belt of Muslim majority areas in British India. There were two areas of concentration, one in the west and one in the east. There was no way these two parts could be joined. So it was decided that the new country, Pakistan, will comprise two territories, West and East Pakistan separated by a long expanse of Indian territory. Secondly, not all Muslim majority areas wanted to be in Pakistan. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, the undisputed leader of the northwestern frontier province and known as Frontier Gandhi, was staunchly opposed to the Twanation theory. Eventually, his voice was simply ignored and the NWFP was made to merge with Pakistan. The third problem was that two of the Muslim-majority provinces of British India, Punjab and Bengal, had very large areas where the non-Muslims were in majority. Eventually it was decided that these two provinces would be bifurcated according to the religious majority at the district or even lower level. This decision could not be made by the midnight of 1415 August. It meant that a large number of people did not know on the day of independence whether they were in India or in Pakistan. The partition of these two provinces caused the deepest trauma of partition. This was related to the fourth and the most intractable of all the problems of partition. This was the problem of minorities on both sides of the border. Lacks of Hindus and Sikhs in the areas that were now in Pakistan and an equally large number of Muslims on the Indian side of Punjab and Bengal, and to some extent Delhi and surrounding areas, found themselves trapped. They were to discover that they were undesirable aliens in their own home, in the land where they and their ancestors had lived for centuries. As soon as it became clear that the country was going to be partitioned, the minorities on both sides became easy targets of attack. No one had quite anticipated the scale of this problem. No one had any plans for handling this. Initially, the people and political leaders kept hoping that this violence was temporary and would be controlled soon. But very soon the violence went out of control. The minorities on both sides of the border were left with no option except to leave their homes, often at a few hours notice. Consequences of partition The year 1947 was the year of one of the largest, most abrupt, unplanned and tragic transfer of population that human history has known. There were killings and atrocities on both sides of the border. In the name of religion people of one community ruthlessly killed and maimed people of the other community. Cities like Lahore, Amritsar and Kolkata became divided into communal zones. Muslims would avoid going into an area where mainly Hindus or Sikhs lived, similarly the Hindus and Sikhs stayed away from areas of Muslim predominance. Forced to abandon their homes and move across borders, people went through immense sufferings.
Minorities on both sides of the border fled their home and often secured temporary shelter in refugee camps. They often found unhelpful local administration and police in what was till recently their own country. They traveled to the other side of the new border by all sorts of means, often by foot. Even during this journey they were often attacked, killed or raped. Thousands of women were abducted on both sides of the border. They were made to convert to the religion of the abductor and were forced into marriage. In many cases women were killed by their own family members to preserve their family honor. Many children were separated from their parents. Those who did manage to cross the border found that they had no home. For lacks of these refugees the countess freedom meant life in refugee camps for months and sometimes for years. Writers, poets and filmmakers in India and Pakistan have expressed the ruthlessness of the killings and the suffering of displacement and violence in their novels, short stories, poems and films. While recounting the trauma of partition, they have often used the phrase that the survivors themselves used to describe partition as a division of hearts. The partition was not merely a division of properties, liabilities and assets, or a political division of the country and the administrative apparatus. What also got divided were the financial assets, and things like tables, chairs, typewriters, paper clips, books and also musical instruments of the police band. The employees of the government and the railways were also divided. Above all, it was a violent separation of communities who had hitherto lived together as neighbors. It is estimated that the partition forced about 80 lakh people to migrate across the new border. The partition was not merely a division of properties, liabilities and assets, or a political division of the country and the administrative apparatus. What also got divided were the financial assets, and things like tables, chairs, typewriters, paper clips, books and also musical instruments of the police band. The employees of the government and the railways were also divided. Above all, it was a violent separation of communities who had hitherto lived together as neighbors. It is estimated that the partition forced about 80 lakh people to migrate across the new border. Between 5 to 10 lakh people were killed in partition-related violence. Beyond the administrative concerns and financial strains, however, the partition posed another deeper issue. The leaders of the Indian national struggle did not believe in the Twanation theory. And yet, partition on religious basis had taken place. Did that make India a Hindu nation automatically? Even after large-scale migration of Muslims to the newly created Pakistan, the Muslim population in India accounted for 12% of the total population in 1951. So, how would the government of India treat its Muslim citizens and other religious minorities, Sikhs, Christians, Jains, Buddhists, Parsis and Jews? The partition had already created severe conflict between the two communities. There were competing political interests behind these conflicts. The Muslim League was formed to protect the interests of the Muslims in colonial India. It was in the forefront of the demand for a separate Muslim nation. Similarly, there were organizations which were trying to organize the Hindus in order to turn India into a Hindu nation. But most leaders of the national movement believed that India must treat persons of all religions equally and that India should not be a country that gave superior status to adherents of one faith and inferior to those who practiced another religion. All citizens would be equal irrespective of their religious affiliation. Being religious or a believer would not be a test of citizenship. They cherished therefore the ideal of a secular nation. This ideal was enshrined in the Indian constitution. Search. 
Shweta noticed that her nana, maternal grandfather, would get very quiet whenever anyone mentioned Pakistan. One day she decided to ask him about it. Her nana told her about how he moved from Lahore to Ludhiana during partition. Both his parents were killed. Even he would not have survived, but a neighboring Muslim family gave him shelter and kept him in hiding for several days. They helped him find some relatives and that is how he managed to cross the border and start a new life. Have you heard a similar story? Ask your grandparents or anyone of that generation about their memories of Independence Day, about the celebration, about the trauma of partition, about the expectations they had from independence. Write down at least two of these stories. Integration of princely states British India was divided into what were called the British Indian provinces and the princely states. The British Indian provinces were directly under the control of the British government. On the other hand, several large and small states ruled by princes, called the princely states, enjoyed some form of control over their internal affairs as long as they accepted British supremacy. This was called paramountcy or suzerainty of the British crown. Princely states covered one third of the land area of the British Indian Empire and one out of four Indians lived under princely rule. The problem just before independence it was announced by the British that with the end of their rule over India, paramountcy of the British crown over princely states would also lapse. This meant that all these states, as many as 565 in all, would become legally independent. The British government took the view that all these states were free to join either India or Pakistan or remain independent if they so wished. This decision was left not to the people but to the princely rulers of these states. This was a very serious problem and could threaten the very existence of a united India. Problems started very soon. First of all, the ruler of Travancore announced that the state had decided on independence. The Nizam of Hyderabad made a similar announcement the next day. Rulers like the Nawab of Bhopal were averse to joining the Constituent Assembly. This response of the rulers of the princely states meant that after independence there was a very real possibility that India would get further divided into a number of small countries. The prospects of democracy for the people in these states also looked bleak. This was a strange situation, since the Indian independence was aimed at unity, self-determination as well as democracy. In most of these princely states, governments were run in a non-democratic manner and their rulers were unwilling to give democratic rights to their populations. Government's approach the interim government took a firm stance against the possible division of India into small principalities of different sizes. The Muslim League opposed the Indian National Congress and took the view that the states should be free to adopt any course they liked. Siddhar Patel was India's Deputy Prime Minister and the Home Minister during the crucial period immediately following independence. He played a historic role in negotiating with the rulers of princely states firmly but diplomatically and bringing most of them into the Indian Union. It may look easy now, but it was a very complicated task which required 
skillful persuasion. For instance, there were 26 small states in today's Orissa. Saurashtra region of Gujarat had 14 big states, 119 small states and numerous other different administrations. The government's approach was guided by three considerations. Firstly, the people of most of the princely states clearly wanted to become part of the Indian Union. Secondly, the government was prepared to be flexible in giving autonomy to some regions. The idea was to accommodate plurality and adopt a flexible approach in dealing with the demands of the regions. Thirdly, in the backdrop of partition, which brought into focus the contest over demarcation of territory. Before the 15th of August 1947, peaceful negotiations had brought almost all states whose territories were contiguous to the new boundaries of India into the Indian Union. The rulers of most of the states signed a document called their Instrument of Accession, which meant that their state agreed to become a part of the Union of India. Accession of the princely states of Junagadh, Hyderabad, Kashmir and Manipur proved more difficult than the rest. The issue of Junagadh was resolved after a plebiscite confirmed people's desire to join India. You will read about Kashmir in Chapter 8. Here, let us look at the cases of Hyderabad and Manipur. Hyderabad, Hyderabad, the largest of the princely states was surrounded entirely by Indian territory. Some parts of the old Hyderabad state are today parts of Maharashtra, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Its ruler carried the title, Nizam, and he was one of the world's richest men. The Nizam wanted an independent status for Hyderabad. He entered into what was called the Standstill Agreement with India in November 1947 for a year while negotiations with the Indian government were going on. In the meantime, a movement of the people of Hyderabad state against the Nizam's rule gathered force. The peasantry in the Telangana region in particular was the victim of Nizam's oppressive rule and rose against him. Women who had seen the worst of this oppression joined the movement in large numbers. Hyderabad town was the nerve center of this movement. The communists and the Hyderabad Congress were in the forefront of the movement. The Nizam responded by unleashing a paramilitary force known as the Razakas on the people. The atrocities and communal nature of the Razakas knew no bounds. They murdered, maimed, raped and looted, targeting particularly the non-Muslims. The central government had to order the army to tackle the situation. In September 1948, Indian army moved in to control the Nizam's forces. After a few days of intermittent fighting, the Nizam surrendered. This led to Hyderabad's accession to India. Manipur a few days before independence, the Maharaja of Manipur, Bodhachandra Singh, signed the instrument of accession with the Indian government on the assurance that the internal autonomy of Manipur would be maintained. Under the pressure of public opinion, the Maharaja held elections in Manipur in June 1948 and the state became a constitutional monarchy. Thus Manipur was the first part of India to hold an election based on universal adult franchise. 
In the Legislative Assembly of Manipur there were sharp differences over the question of merger of Manipur with India. While the State Congress wanted the merger, other political parties were opposed to this. The government of India succeeded in pressurizing the Maharaja into signing a merger agreement in September 1949, without consulting the popularly elected Legislative Assembly of Manipur. This caused a lot of anger and resentment in Manipur, the repercussions of which are still being felt. Reorganization of State The process of nation-building did not come to an end with partition and integration of princely states. Now the challenge was to draw the internal boundaries of the Indian states. This was not just a matter of administrative divisions. The boundaries had to be drawn in a way so that the linguistic and cultural plurality of the country could be reflected without affecting the unity of the nation. During colonial rule, the state boundaries were drawn either on administrative convenience or simply coincided with the territories annexed by the British government or the territories ruled by the princely powers. Our national movement had rejected these divisions as artificial and had promised the linguistic principle as the basis of formation of states. In fact after the Nagpur session of Congress in 1920 the principle was recognized as the basis of the reorganization of the Indian National Congress Party itself. Many provincial Congress committees were created by linguistic zones, which did not follow the administrative divisions of British India. Things changed after independence and partition. Our leaders felt that carving out states on the basis of language might lead to disruption and disintegration. It was also felt that this would draw attention away from other social and economic challenges that the country faced. The central leadership decided to postpone matters. The need for postponement was also felt because the fate of the princely states had not been decided. Also, the memory of partition was still fresh. This decision of the national leadership was challenged by the local leaders and the people. Protests began in the Telugu-speaking Rees of the old Madras province, which included present-day Tamil Nadu, parts of Andhra Pradesh, Kerala and Karnataka, Thevashalandra movement, as the movement for separate Andhra was called, demanded that the Telugu-speaking areas should be separated from the Madras province of which they were a part and be made into a separate Andhra province. Nearly all the political forces in the Andhra region were in favor of linguistic reorganization of the then Madras province. The movement gathered momentum as a result of the central government's vacillation. Potter Sri Ramulu, a Congress leader and a veteran Gandhian, went on an indefinite fast that led to his death after 56 days. This caused great unrest and resulted in violent outbursts in Andhra region. People in large numbers took to the streets. Many were injured or lost their lives in police firing. In Madras, several legislators resigned their seats in protest. Finally, the Prime Minister announced the formation of a separate Andhra state in December 1952. The formation of Andhra Pradesh spurred the struggle for making of other states on linguistic lines in other parts of the country. These struggles forced the central government into appointing a state's reorganization commission in 1953 to look into the question of redrawing of the boundaries of states. The commission in its report accepted that the boundaries of the state should reflect the boundaries of different languages. On the basis of its report the State's Reorganization Act was passed in 1956. 
This led to the creation of 14 states and six union territories. One of the most important concerns in the early years was that demands for separate states would endanger the unity of the country. It was felt that linguistic states may foster separatism and create pressures on the newly founded nation. But the leadership, under popular pressure, finally made a choice in favor of linguistic states. It was hoped that if we accept the regional and linguistic claims of all regions, the threat of division and separatism would be reduced. Besides, the accommodation of regional demands and the formation of linguistic states were also seen as more democratic. Now it is more than 50 years since the formation of linguistic states. We can say that linguistic states and the movements for the formation of these states changed the nature of democratic politics and leadership in some basic ways. The path to politics and power was now open to people other than the small English-speaking elite. Linguistic reorganization also gave some uniform basis to the drawing of state boundaries. It did not lead to disintegration of the country as many had feared earlier. On the contrary it strengthened national unity. Above all, the linguistic states underlined the acceptance of the principle of diversity. When we say that India adopted democracy, it does not simply mean that India embraced a democratic constitution, nor does it merely mean that India adopted the format of elections. The choice was larger than that. It was a choice in favor of recognizing and accepting the existence of differences which could at times be oppositional. Democracy, in other words, was associated with plurality of ideas and ways of life. Much of the politics in the later period was to take place within this framework. Fast forward creation of new states the acceptance of the principle of linguistic states did not mean, however, that all states immediately became linguistic states. There was an experiment of bilingual Bombay state consisting of Gujarati and Marathi speaking people. After a popular agitation, the states of Maharashtra and Gujarat were created in 1960. In Punjab also, there were two linguistic groups, Hindi-speaking and Punjabi-speaking. The Punjabi-speaking people demanded a separate state. But it was not granted with other states in 1956. Statehood for Punjab came 10 years later, in 1966, when the territories of today's Haryana and Himachal Pradesh were separated from the larger Punjab state. Another major reorganization of states took place in the northeast in 1972. Meghalaya was carved out of Assam in 1972. Manipur and Tripura too emerged as separate states in the same year. The states of Arunachal Pradesh and Mizoram came into being in 1987. Nagaland had become a state much earlier in 1963. Language did not, however, remain the sole basis of organization of states. In later years subregions raised demands for separate states on the basis of a separate regional culture or complaints of regional imbalance in development. Three such states, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh and Uttarankal, were created in 2000. The story of reorganization has not come to an end. There are many regions in the country where there are movements demanding separate and smaller states. These include Telangana in Andhra Pradesh, Vidarbha in Maharashtra, Harit Pradesh in the western region of Uttar Pradesh and the northern region of West Bengal. The dawn of freedom fies Ahmed fies this scarred, marred brightness, this bitten be night dawn the one that was awaited, surely, this is not that dawn. 
This is not the dawn yearning for which had we set out, friends, hoping to find sometime, somewhere the final destination of stars in the wilderness of the sky. Somewhere, at least, must be a shore for the languid waves of the night, somewhere at least must anchor the sad boat of the heart. Translation of an extract from Urdu poem Subhizadi Fiz Ahmed Fiz, 1911-1984, born in Sialkot, stayed in Pakistan after partition. A leftist in his political leanings, he opposed the Pakistan regime and was imprisoned. Collections of his poetry include Nakshafariadi, Dust Sabar and Zindanamar. Regarded as one of the greatest poets of South Asia in the 20th century. We should begin to work in that spirit and in course of time all these angularities of the majority and minority communities, the Hindu community and the Muslim community, because even as regards Muslims you have Pathans, Punjabish, Shias, Sunnis and so on and among the Hindus you have Brahmins, Vishnavas, Katris, also Bengalis, Madrasis, and so on, will vanish. You are free, you are free to go to your temples, you are free to go to your mosques or to any other place of worship in this state of Pakistan. You may belong to any religion a caste or creed, that has nothing to do with the business of the state. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Presidential Address to the Constituent Assembly of Pakistan at Karachi, the 11th of August 1947. Garam Hawa. Salam Mirza, a shoe manufacturer in Agra, increasingly finds himself a stranger amid the people he has lived with all his life. He feels lost in the emerging reality after partition. His business suffers and a refugee from the other side of partitioned India occupies his ancestral dwelling. His daughter too has a tragic end. He believes that things would soon be normal again. But many of his family members decide to move to Pakistan. Salam is torn between an impulse to move out to Pakistan and an urge to stay back. A decisive moment comes when Salem witnesses a student's procession demanding fair treatment from the government. His son Sikanda has joined the procession. Can you imagine what Mirza Salem finally did? What do you think you would have done in these circumstances? Year, 1973. Director, M. S. Satyu. Screenplay, Kaivi Azmi. Actors, Balraj Sahana, Jalal Aga. Farooq Sheikh, Geeta Siddharth. Mahatma Gandhi's sacrifice on 15 August 1947 Mahatma Gandhi did not participate in any of the Independence Day celebrations. He was in Kolkata in the areas which were torn by gruesome riots between Hindus and Muslims. He was saddened by the communal violence and disheartened that the principles of ahimsa, non-violence, and satyagraha, active but non-violent resistance, that he had lived and worked for, had failed to bind the people in troubled times. Gandhiji went on to persuade the Hindus and Muslims to give up violence. His presence in Kolkata greatly improved the situation, and the coming of independence was celebrated in a spirit of communal harmony, with joyous dancing in the streets. Gandhiji's prayer meetings attracted large crowds. But this was short-lived as riots between Hindus and Muslims erupted once again and Gandhiji had to resort to a fast to bring peace. Next month Gandhiji moved to Delhi where large-scale violence had erupted. 
He was deeply concerned about ensuring that Muslims should be allowed to stay in India with dignity, as equal citizens. He was also concerned about the relations between India and Pakistan. He was unhappy with what he saw as the Indian government's decision not to honor its financial commitments to Pakistan. With all this in mind he undertook what turned out to be his last fast in January 1948. As in Kolkata, his fast had a dramatic effect in Delhi. Communal tension and violence reduced. Muslims of Delhi and surrounding areas could safely return to their homes. The government of India agreed to give Pakistan its dues. Gandhiji's actions were however not liked by all. Extremists in both the communities blamed him for their conditions. He was particularly disliked by those who wanted Hindus to take revenge or who wanted India to become a country for the Hindus, just as Pakistan was for Muslims. They accused Gandhiji of acting in the interests of the Muslims in Pakistan. Gandhiji thought that these people were misguided. He was convinced that any attempt to make India into a country only for the Hindus would destroy India. His steadfast pursuit of Hindu-Muslim unity provoked Hindu extremists so much that they made several attempts to assassinate Gandhiji. Despite this he refused to accept armed protection and continued to meet everyone during his prayer meetings. Finally, on 30 January 1948, one such extremist, Nataram Vinayak Godsa, walked up to Gandhiji during his evening prayer in Delhi and fired three bullets at him, killing him instantly. Thus ended a lifelong struggle for truth, non-violence, justice and tolerance. Gandhiji's death had an almost magical effect on the communal situation in the country. Partition-related anger and violence suddenly subsided. The government of India cracked down on organizations that were spreading communal hatred. Organizations like the Rashtriya Swayam Swayak Sang were banned for some time. Communal politics began to lose its appeal. Siddhar Vallabhbhai Patel, 1875-1950, leader of the Freedom Movement, Congress leader, follower of Mahatma Gandhi, Deputy Prime Minister and First Home Minister of Independent India, played an important role in the integration of princely states with India, member of important committees of the Constituent Assembly on Fundamental Rights, Minorities, Provincial Constitution, etc. Potter Sri Ramulu, 1901-1952, Gandhian worker, left government job to participate in. Salt Satyagraha, also participated in individual Satyagraha, went on a fast in 1946 demanding that temples in Madras province be opened to Dalits, undertook a fast unto death from 19. October 1952 demanding separate state of Andhra Pradesh, died during the fast on 15 December 1952. In this chapter, the challenge of nation building, covered in the last chapter, was accompanied by the challenge of instituting democratic politics.
Thus, electoral competition among political parties began immediately after independence. In this chapter, we look at the first decade of electoral politics in order to understand the establishment of a system of free and fair elections, the domination of the Congress Party in the years immediately after independence, and the emergence of opposition parties and their policies. Challenge of building democracy. You now have an idea of the difficult circumstances in which independent India was born. You have read about the serious challenge of nation building that confronted the country right in the beginning. Faced with such serious challenges, leaders in many other countries of the world decided that their country could not afford to have democracy. They said that national unity was their first priority and that democracy will introduce differences and conflicts. Therefore many of the countries that gained freedom from colonialism experienced non-democratic rule. It took various forms, nominal democracy but effective control by one leader, one party rule a direct army rule. Non-democratic regimes always started with a promise of restoring democracy very soon. But once they established themselves, it was very difficult to dislodge them. The conditions in India were not very different. But the leaders of the newly independent India decided to take the more difficult path. Any other path would have been surprising, for our freedom struggle was deeply committed to the idea of democracy. Our leaders were conscious of the critical role of politics in any democracy. They did not see politics as a problem, they saw it as a way of solving the problems. Every society needs to decide how it will govern and regulate itself. There are always different policy alternatives to choose from. There are different groups with different and conflicting aspirations. How do we resolve these differences? Democratic politics is an answer to this question. While competition and power are the two most visible things about politics, the purpose of political activity is and should be deciding and pursuing public interest. This is the route our leaders decided to take. Last year you studied how our constitution was drafted. You would remember that the constitution was ready and signed on the 26th of November 1949 and it came into effect on the 26th of January 1950. At that time the country was being ruled by an interim government. It was now necessary to install the first democratically elected government of the country. The constitution had laid down the rules, now the machine had to be put in place. Initially it was thought that this was only a matter of a few months. The election commission of India was set up in January 1950. Sukumar Sen became the first chief election commissioner. The country's first general elections were expected sometime in 1950 itself. But the election commission discovered that it was not going to be easy to hold a free and fair election in a country of India's size. Holding an election required delimitation or drawing the boundaries of the electoral constituencies. It also required preparing the electoral rolls of the list of all the citizens eligible to vote. Both these tasks took a lot of time. When the first draft of the rolls was published, it was discovered that the names of nearly 40 lakh women were not recorded in the list. They were simply listed as wife of a daughter of. The election commission refused to accept these entries and ordered a revision if possible and deletion if necessary. Preparing for the first general election was a mammoth exercise. No election on this scale had ever been conducted in the world before. 
At that time there were 17 Crowry eligible voters, who had to elect about 3,200 MLAs and 489 members of Lok Sabha. Only 15% of these eligible voters were literate. Therefore the election commission had to think of some special method of voting. The election commission trained over 3 lakh officers and polling staff to conduct the elections. It was not just the size of the country and the electorate that made this election unusual. The first general election was also the first big test of democracy in a poor and illiterate country. Till then democracy had existed only in the prosperous countries, mainly in Europe and North America, where nearly everyone was literate. By that time many countries in Europe had not given voting rights to all women. In this context India's experiment with universal adult franchise appeared very bold and risky. An Indian editor called it, the biggest gamble in history. Organizer, a magazine, wrote that Jawaharlal Nehru, would live to confess the failure of universal adult franchise in India. A British member of the Indian Civil Service claimed that, a future and more enlightened age will view with astonishment the absurd farce of recording the votes of millions of illiterate people. The elections had to be postponed twice and finally held from October 1951 to February 1952. But this election is referred to as the 1952 election since most parts of the country voted in January 1952. It took six months for the campaigning, polling and counting to be completed. Election were competitive there were on average more than four candidates for each seat. The level of participation was encouraging, more than half the eligible voters turned out to vote on the day of elections. When the results were declared these were accepted as fair even by the losers. The Indian experiment had proved the critics wrong. The Times of India held that the polls have confounded all those skeptics who thought the introduction of adult franchise too risky an experiment in this country. The Hindustan Times claimed that there is universal agreement that the Indian people have conducted themselves admirably in the largest experiment in democratic elections in the history of the world. Observers outside India were equally impressed. India's general election of 1952 became a landmark in the history of democracy all over the world. It was no longer possible to argue that democratic elections could not be held in conditions of poverty or lack of education. It proved that democracy could be practiced anywhere in the world. Congress dominance in the first three general elections the results of the first general election did not surprise anyone. The Indian National Congress was expected to win this election. The Congress Party, as it was popularly known, had inherited the legacy of the national movement. It was the only party then to have an organization spread all over the country. And finally, in Jawaharlal Nehru, the party had the most popular and charismatic leader in Indian politics. He led the Congress campaign and toured through the country. When the final results were declared, the extent of the victory of the Congress did surprise many. The party won 364 of the 489 seats in the first Lok Sabha and finished way ahead of any other challenger. The Communist Party of India that came next in terms of seats won only 16 seats. The state elections were held with the Lok Sabha elections. The Congress scored big victory in those elections as well. It won a majority of seats in all the states except Travancore Cochin, part of today's Kerala, Madras and Orissa. Finally even in these states the Congress formed the government. So. 
party ruled all over the country at the national and the state level. As expected, Jawaharlal Nehru became the Prime Minister after the first general election. A look at the electoral map on the last page would give you a sense of the dominance of the Congress during the period 19,521,962. In the second and the third general elections, held in 1957 and 1962 respectively, the Congress maintained the same position in the Lok Sabha by winning three-fourths of the seats. None of the opposition parties could win even one-tenth of the number of seats won by the Congress. In the state assembly elections, the Congress did not get majority in a few cases. The most significant of these cases was in Kerala in 1957 when a coalition led by the CPI formed the government. Apart from exceptions like this, the Congress controlled the national and all the state governments. The extent of the victory of the Congress was artificially boosted by our electoral system. The Congress won three out of every four seats but it did not get even half of the votes. In 1952, for example, the Congress obtained 45% of the total votes. But it managed to win 74% of the seats. The Socialist Party, the second largest party in terms of votes, secured more than 10% of the votes all over the country. But it could not even win 3% of the seats. How did this happen? For this you need to recall the discussion about the first-past-the-post method in your textbook, Constitution at Work, last year. In this system of election, that has been adopted in our country, the party that gets more votes than others tends to get much more than its proportional share. That is exactly what worked in favor of the Congress. If we add up the votes of all the non-Congress candidates it was more than the votes of the Congress. But the non-Congress votes were divided between different rival parties and candidates. So the Congress was still way ahead of the opposition and managed to win. Communist victory in Kerala as early as in 1957, the Congress party had the bitter taste of defeat in Kerala. In the assembly elections held in March 1957, the Communist party won the largest number of seats to the Kerala legislature. The party won 60 of the 126 seats and had the support of five independents. The governor invited E. M. S. Nambadaripad, the leader of the Communist Legislature Party, to form the ministry. For the first time in the world, a Communist Party government had come to power through democratic elections. On losing power in the state, the Congress party began a liberation struggle against the elected government. The CPI had come to power on the promise of carrying out radical and progressive policy measures. The communists claimed that the agitation was led by vested interests and religious organizations. In 1959 the Congress government at the center dismissed the communist government in Kerala under Article 356 of the Constitution. This decision proved very controversial and was widely cited as the first instance of the misuse of constitutional emergency powers. Socialist Party The origins of the Socialist Party can be traced back to the mass movement stage of the Indian National Congress in the pre-independence era. The Congress Socialist Party CSP, was formed within the Congress in 1934 by a group of young leaders who wanted a more radical and egalitarian Congress. In 1948, the Congress amended its constitution to prevent its members from having a dual-party membership. 
This forced the socialists to form a separate socialist party in 1948. The party's electoral performance caused much disappointment to its supporters. Although the party had presence in most of the states of India, it could achieve electoral success only in a few pockets the socialists believed in the ideology of democratic socialism which distinguished them both from the Congress as well as from the communists. They criticized the Congress for favoring capitalists and landlords and for ignoring the workers and the peasants. But the socialists faced a dilemma when in 1955 the Congress declared its goal to be the socialist pattern of society. Thus it became difficult for the socialists to present themselves as an effective alternative to the Congress. Some of them, led by Ramanohar here, increased their distance from and criticism of the Congress party. Some others like Ahsoka Mehta advocated a limited cooperation with the Congress. The Socialist Party went through many splits and reunions leading to the formation of many Socialist Parties. These included the Kiss and Mazdal Praja Party, the Praja Socialist Party and Samyukta Socialist Party. Jayaprakash Narayan, Akut Patwardhan, Asoka Mehta, Acharya Narendra Dev, Ramanohar Lohir and S. M. Joshi were among the leaders of the Socialist Parties. Many parties in contemporary India, like the Samajwadi Party, the Rashtriya Janata Dal, Janata Dal, United, and the Janata Dal, Secular, trace their origins to the Socialist part. Nature of Congress dominance India is not the only country to have experienced the dominance of one party. If we look around the world, we find many other examples of own party dominance. But there is a crucial difference between these and the Indian experience. In the rest of the cases the dominance of one party was ensured by compromising democracy. In some countries like China, Cuba and Syria the constitution permits only a single party to rule the country. Some others like Myanmar, Belarus, Egypt and Eritrea are effectively own party states due to legal and military measures. Until a few years ago, Mexico, South Korea and Taiwan were also effectively own party dominant states. What distinguished the dominance of the Congress Party in India from all these cases was it happened under democratic conditions. Many parties contested elections in conditions of free and fair elections and yet the Congress managed to win election after election. This was similar to the dominance the African National Congress has enjoyed in South Africa after the end of apartheid. The roots of this extraordinary success of the Congress Party go back to the legacy of the freedom struggle. Congress was seen as inheritor of the national movement. Many leaders who were in the forefront of that struggle were now contesting elections as Congress candidates. The Congress was already a very well-organized party and by the time the other parties could even think of a strategy, the Congress had already started its campaign. In fact, many parties were formed only around independence or after that. Thus, the Congress had their first off the blocks advantage. By the time of independence the party had not only spread across the length and breadth of the country as we had seen in the maps but also had an organizational network down to the local level. Most importantly, as the Congress was till recently a national movement, its nature was all-inclusive. All these factors contributed to the dominance of the Congress Party.
Congress is social and ideological coalition you have already studied the history of how Congress evolved from its origins in 1885 as a pressure group for the newly educated, professional and commercial classes to a mass movement in the 20th century. This laid the basis for its eventual transformation into a mass political party and its subsequent domination of the political system. Thus the Congress began as a party dominated by the English-speaking, upper caste, upper middle class and urban elite. But with every civil disobedience movement it launched, its social base widened. It brought together diverse groups, whose interests were often contradictory. Peasants and industrialists, urban dwellers and villages, workers and owners, middle, lower and upper classes and castes, all found space in the Congress. Gradually, its leadership also expanded beyond the upper caste and upper class professionals to agriculture-based leaders with a rural orientation. By the time of independence, the Congress was transformed into a rainbow-like social coalition broadly representing India's diversity in terms of classes and castes, religions and languages and various interests. Many of these groups merged their identity within the Congress. Very often they did not and continued to exist within the Congress as groups and individuals holding different beliefs. In this sense the Congress was an ideological coalition as well, it accommodated the revolutionary and pacifist, conservative and radical, extremist and moderate and the right, left and all shades of the center. The Congress was a platform for numerous groups, interests and even political parties to take part in the national movement. In pre-independence days, many organizations and parties with their own constitution and organizational structure were allowed to exist within the Congress. Some of these, like the Congress Socialist Party, later separated from the Congress and became opposition parties. Despite differences regarding the methods, specific programs and policies the party managed to contain if not resolve differences and build a consensus. Tolerance and management of factions this coalition-like character of the Congress gave it an unusual strength. Firstly, a coalition accommodates all those who join it. Therefore, it has to avoid any extreme position and strike a balance on almost all issues. Compromise and inclusiveness are the hallmarks of a coalition. This strategy put the opposition in a difficulty. Anything that the opposition wanted to say, would also find a place in the program and ideology of the Congress. Secondly, in a party that has the nature of a coalition, there is a greater tolerance of internal differences and ambitions of various groups and leaders are accommodated. The Congress did both these things during the freedom struggle and continued doing this even after independence. That is why, even if a group was not happy with the position of the party or with its share of power, it would remain inside. Party and fight the other groups rather than leaving the party and becoming an opposition. These groups inside the party are called factions. The coalitional nature of the Congress party tolerated and in fact encouraged various factions. Some of these factions were based on ideological considerations but very often these factions were rooted in personal ambitions and rivalries. Instead of being a weakness, internal factionalism became a strength of the Congress. Since there was room within the party for various factions to fight with each other, it meant that leaders representing different interests and ideologies remained within the Congress rather than go out and form a new party. Most of the state units of the Congress were made up of numerous factions. 
The factions took different ideological positions making the Congress appear as a grand centrist party. The other parties primarily attempted to influence these factions and thereby indirectly influenced policy and decision making from their margins. They were far removed from the actual exercise of authority. They were not alternatives to the ruling party, instead they constantly pressurized and criticized, censured and influenced the Congress. The system of factions functioned as balancing mechanism within the ruling party. Political competition therefore took place within the Congress. In that sense, in the first decade of electoral competition the Congress acted both as the ruling party as well as the opposition. That is why this period of Indian politics has been described as the Congress system. Emergence of opposition parties as we have noted above, it is not that India did not have opposition parties during this period. While discussing the results of the elections, we have already come across the names of many parties other than the Congress. Even then India had a larger number of diverse and vibrant opposition parties than many other multi-party democracies. Some of these had come into being even before the first general election of 1952. Some of these parties played an important part in the politics of the country in the 60s and 70s. The roots of almost all the non-Congress parties of today can be traced to one or the other of the opposition parties of the 1950s. All these opposition parties succeeded in gaining only a token representation in the Lok Sabha and state assemblies during this period. Yet their presence played a crucial role in maintaining the democratic character of the system. These parties offered a sustained and often principled criticism of the policies and practices of the Congress Party. This kept the ruling party under check and often changed the balance of power within the Congress. By keeping democratic political alternative alive these parties prevented the resentment with the system from turning anti-democratic. These parties also groomed the leaders who were to play a crucial role in the shaping of our country. In the early years there was a lot of mutual respect between the leaders of the Congress and those of the opposition. The interim government that ruled the country after the declaration of independence and the first general election included opposition leaders like Dr. Ambedkar and Shyama Prasad Mukherjee in the cabinet. Jawaharlal Nehru often referred to his fondness for the Socialist Party and invited socialist leaders like Jayaprakash Narayan to join his government. This kind of personal relationship with and respect for political adversaries declined after the party competition grew more intense. Thus this first phase of democratic politics in our country was quite unique. The inclusive character of the national movement led by the Congress enabled it to attract different sections, groups and interests making it a broad-based social and ideological coalition. The key role of the Congress in the freedom struggle thus gave it a head start over others. As the ability of the Congress to accommodate all interests and all aspirants for political power steadily declined, other political parties started gaining greater significance. Thus, Congress dominance constitutes only one phase in the politics of the country. We shall come to the other phases in later parts of this textbook. Party competition in a Bihar village. When two buffaloes fight, the grass beneath them gets crushed. The Congress and Socialist parties are fighting with each other. Both of them are seeking new members. 
The poor people will be ground between the two grindstones. No, the poor people won't be crushed. In fact, they'll benefit, was someone's reply. Things aren't accomplished by one party alone. It is the competition and rivalry between two groups that benefits the public. The news of Socialist Party meeting had agitated the Santhils. The news of the opening of the hospital hadn't made much impression on them, nor did they ever bother much about the fights and quarrels, or the friendly gatherings of the villages. But this meeting was for the tillers of the soil. To whom does the land belong? To the tiller. He who tills will sow. He who sows will harvest. He who works will eat, come what may. Kali Sharon lectured. There was turmoil in the district office of the Congress party too. They were about to elect a party chairman. There were four candidates, two real contenders and two dummy candidates. It was a contest between Rajputs and Bhumihas, the wealthy businessmen and Zamanders from both the castes were cruising all over the district in their motorcars, campaigning. All kinds of mudslinging was going on between them. The Seth who owned the Kartiha Cotton Mill was representing the Bhumiha party, and the owner of Farbagang Jute Mill was representing the Rajputs. You should see the money there flashing around. Translated extracts from Fanishwar Nathrina's novel, Mela Anchal. The novel is set in. Purnia district in northeast Bihar in the early years after independence. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad, 1888-1958, original name, Abul Kalam Mohiyuddin Ahmed, scholar of Islam, freedom fighter and congress leader, proponent of Hindu-Muslim unity, opposed to partition, member of constituent assembly, education minister in the first cabinet of Free India. Rajkumari Amrit Kau, 1889-1964, a Gandhian and freedom fighter, belonged to the royal family of Kapurthala, inherited Christian religion from her mother, member of constituent assembly, minister for health in independent India's first ministry, continued as health minister till 1957. Acharya Narendra Dev, 1889 to 1956, freedom fighter and founding president of the Congress Socialist Party, jailed several times during the freedom movement, active in peasants' movement, a scholar of Buddhism, after independence led the Socialist Party and later the Praja Socialist Party. Babasaheb Bimro Ramji Ambedkar, 1891-1956, leader of the Antikasta movement and the struggle for justice to the Dalits, scholar and intellectual, founder of Independent Labour Party, later founded the Scheduled Castes Federation, planned the formation of the Republican Party of India, member of Viceroy's Executive Council during the Second World War, Chairman, Drafting Committee of the Constituent Assembly, Minister in Nera's First Cabinet after independence, resigned in 1951 due to differences over the Hindu Code Bill, adopted Buddhism in 1956, with thousands of followers. National Revolutionary Party Founded in 1929, as National Revolutionary Party and later renamed as the Institutional Revolutionary Party, the PRI, in Spanish, exercised power in Mexico for almost six decades. It represented the legacy of the Mexican Revolution. Originally PRI was a mixture of various interests including political and military leaders, labor and peasant organizations and numerous political parties. 
Over a period of time, Plutarco Elias Cayez, the founder of PRI, was able to capture the organization and thereby the government. Elections were held at regular intervals and it was the PRI which won every time. Other parties existed in name only so as to give the ruling party greater legitimacy. The electoral laws were operated in a manner so as to ensure that the PRI always won. Elections were often rigged and manipulated by the ruling party. Its rule was described as the perfect dictatorship. Finally the party lost in the presidential elections held in 2000. Mexico is no longer a own party-dominated country. But the tactics adopted by the PRI during the period of its dominance had a long-term effect on the health of democracy. The citizens have yet to develop full confidence in the free and fair NRA, K. Gopalan, 1904-1977, communist leader from Kerala, worked as a congress worker initially, joined the Communist Party in 1939, after the split in the Communist Party in 1964, joined the CPI, M, and worked for strengthening the party, respected as a parliamentarian, member of parliament from 1952. Tour of Elections The Communist Party of India In the early 1920s communist groups emerged in different parts of India taking inspiration from the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and advocating socialism as the solution to problems affecting the country. From 1935, the communists worked mainly from within the fold of the Indian National Congress. A parting of ways took place in December 1941, when the communists decided to support the British in their war against Nazi Germany. Unlike other non-Congress parties the CPI had a well-oiled party machinery and dedicated cadre at the time of independence. However, independence raised different voices in the party. The basic question that troubled the party was the nature of Indian. Independence. Was India really free or was freedom a sham? Soon after independence, the party thought that the transfer of power in 1947 was not true independence and encouraged violent uprisings in Telangana. The communists failed to generate popular support for their position and were crushed by the armed forces. This forced them to rethink their position. In 1951 the communist party abandoned the path of violent revolution and decided to participate in the approaching general elections. In the first general election, CPI won 16 seats and emerged as the largest opposition party. The party's support was more concentrated in Andhra Pradesh, West Bengal, Bihar and Kerala. A. K. Gopalan, S. A. Danger, E. M. S. Nambadaripad, P. C. Joshi, A. J. Ghosh and P. Sundaraya were among the notable leaders of the CPI. The party went through a major split in 1964 following the ideological rift between Soviet Union and China. The pro-Soviet faction remained as the CPI, while the opponents formed the CPI. -M. Both these parties continue to exist to this day. Let us see a film. Simasan. This Marathi film, based on Arun Sadha's two novels Simasan and Mumbai Danang, depicts the tussle for the post of chief minister in Maharashtra. The story is told through journalist Digu Tipnis as the silent sutradhar. It tries to capture the intense power struggle within the ruling party and the secondary role of the opposition. Finance Minister, Vishwasray Odabada is making all-out efforts to unseat the incumbent Chief Minister. 
Both contenders are trying to woo trade union leader De Costa to obtain his support. In this factional fight, other politicians too seek to obtain maximum advantage while bargaining with both sides. Smuggling in. Mumbai and the grim social reality in rural Maharashtra form the subplots in this film. Year, 1981. Director, Jabar Patel. Screenplay, Vijay Tandulka. Cast, Nilu Fuel, Arun Sarnaik. Dr. Sriram Lagu, Satish. Dubashi, Dutta Bhatt, Madhukar. Toradmal, Madhav Wav, Mohan. Agasha. Dean Dale Upadjaya, 1916-1968, full-time RSS worker since 1942. Founder member of the Bharati Yajana Sangh, General Secretary and later President of Bharati Yajana Sangh, initiated the concept of integral humanism. Bharati Yajana Sangh the Bharati Yajana Sang was formed in 1951 with Shyama Prasad Mukherjee as its founder president. Its lineage however can be traced back to the Rashtriya Swayam Sivak Sang RSS, and the Hindu Mahasabha before independence. The Jana Sang was different from other parties in terms of ideology and programs. It emphasized the idea of one country, one culture and one nation and believed that the country could become modern, progressive and strong on the basis of Indian culture and traditions. The party called for a reunion of India and Pakistan in Akhand Bharat. The party was in forefront of the agitation to replace English with Hindi as the official language of India and was also Opposed to the granting of concessions to religious and cultural minorities, the party was a consistent advocate of India developing nuclear weapons especially after China carried out its atomic tests in 1964. In the 1950s Jana Sang remained on the margins of the electoral. politics and was able to secure only three Lok Sabha seats in 1952 elections and four seats in nineteen fifty seven general elections to Lok Sabha. In the early years its support came mainly from there. Urban areas in the Hindi-speaking states like Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Delhi and Uttar Pradesh. The party's leaders included Shyama Prasad Mukherjee, Dean Dale Upadhyaya, and Balraj Madhok. The Bharati Janata Party traces its roots to the Bharati Yajana Sang. C. Raja Gopalachari, 1878-1972, a senior leader of Congress and literary writer, close associate of Mahatma Gandhi, member of Constituent Assembly, first Indian to be the Governor General of India, 1948-1950, Minister in Union Cabinet, later became Chief Minister of Madras State, first recipient of the Bharat Ratna Award, founder of the Swatantra Party, 1959. Swatantra Party. Swatantra Party was formed in August 1959 after the Nagpur resolution of the Congress, which called for land ceilings, takeover of food grain trade by the state, and adoption of cooperative farming. The party was led by old congressmen like C. 
Raja Gopalachari, K. M. Munshi, N. G. Ranga and Minumasa. The party stood out from the others in terms of its position on economic issues. The Swatantra party wanted the government to be less and less involved in controlling the economy. It believed that prosperity could come only through individual freedom. It was critical of the development strategy of state intervention in the economy, centralized planning, nationalization and the Congress which called for land ceilings, takeover of food grain trade by the state and adoption of cooperative farming. The party was led by old congressmen like C. Rajago Palachari, K. M. Munshi, N. G. Ranga and Minu Masa. The party stood out from the others in terms of its position on economic issues. The Swatantra party wanted the government to be less and less involved in controlling the economy. It believed that prosperity could come only through public sector. It instead favored expansion of a free private sector. The Swatantra party was against land ceilings in agriculture and opposed cooperative farming and state trading. It was also opposed to the progressive tax regime and demanded dismantling of the licensing regime. It was critical of the policy of non-alignment and maintaining friendly relations with the Soviet Union and advocated closer ties with the United States. The Swatantra party gained strength in different parts of the country by way of merger. With numerous regional parties and interests. It attracted the landlords and princes who wanted to protect their land and status that was being threatened by the land reforms legislation. The industrialists and business class who were against nationalization and the licensing policies also supported the party. Its narrow social base and the lack of a dedicated cadre of party members did not allow it to build a strong organizational network. Shyama Prasad Mukherjee, 1901-1953, leader of Hindu Mahasabha, founder of Bharati Yajana Sangh, minister in Nehru's first cabinet after independence, resigned in 1950 due to differences over relations with Pakistan, member of Constituent Assembly and later, the first Lok Sabha, was opposed to India's policy of autonomy to Jammu and Kashmir, arrested during Jana Sam's agitation against Kashmir policy, died during attention. The chapter 3. In this chapter, in the last two chapters we have studied how the leaders of independent India responded to the challenges of nation building and establishing democracy. Let us now turn to the third challenge, that of economic development to ensure well-being of all. As in the case of the first two challenges, our leaders chose a path that was different and difficult. In this case their success was much more limited, for this challenge was tougher and more enduring. In this chapter, we study the story of political choices involved in some of the key questions of economic development. What were the key choices and debates about development? Which strategy was adopted by our leaders in the first two decades? And why? What were the main achievements and limitations of this strategy? Why was this development strategy abandoned in later years? Politics of planned development 
as the global demand for steel increases, Orissa, which has one of the largest reserves of untapped iron ore in the country, is being seen as an important investment destination. The state government hopes to cash in on this unprecedented demand for iron ore and has signed Memorandum of Understanding MAL, with both international and domestic steel makers. The government believes that this would bring in necessary capital investment and provide a lot of employment opportunities. The iron ore resources lie in some of the most underdeveloped and predominantly tribal districts of the state. The tribal population fears that the setting up of industries would mean displacement from their home and livelihood. The environmentalists fear that mining and industry would pollute the environment. The central government feels that if the industry is not allowed it would set a bad example and discourage investments in the country. Can you identify the various interests involved in this case? What are their key points of conflict? Do you think there are any common points on which everyone can agree? Can this issue be resolved in a way which satisfies all the various interests? As you ask these questions, you would find yourself facing yet bigger questions. What kind of development does Orissa need? Indeed, whose need can be called Oris Sash need? Political contestation. These questions cannot be answered by an expert. Decisions of this kind involve weighing the interests of one social group against another, present generation against future generations. In a democracy such major decisions should be taken or at least approved by the people be themselves. It is important to take advice from experts on mining, from environmentalists and from economists. Yet the final decision must be a political decision, taken by people's representatives who are in touch with the feelings of the people. After independence our country had to make a series of major decisions like this. Each of these decisions could not be made independent of other such decisions. All these decisions were bound together by a shared vision a model of economic development. Almost everyone agreed that the development of India should mean both economic growth and social and economic justice. It was also agreed that this matter cannot be left to businessmen, industrialists and farmers themselves, that the government should play a key role in this. There was disagreement, however, on the kind of role that the government must play in ensuring growth with justice. Was it necessary to have a centralized institution to plan for the entire country? Should the government itself run some key industries and business? How much importance was to be attached to the needs of justice if it differed from the requirements of economic growth? Each of these questions involved contestation which has continued ever since. Each of the decision had political consequence. Most of these issues involved political judgment and required consultations among political parties and approval of the public. That is why we need to study the process of development as a part of the history of politics in India. Ideas of development Very often this contestation involves the very idea of development. The example of Orissa shows us that it is not enough to say that everyone wants development. For development has different meanings for different sections of the people. Development would mean different things for example, to an industrialist who is planning to set up a steel plant, to an urban consumer of steel and to the Adivasai who lives in that region. Thus any discussion on development is bound to generate contradictions, conflicts and debates. 
The first decade after independence witnessed a lot of debate around this question. It was common then, as it is even now, for people to refer to the West as the standard for measuring development. Development was about becoming more modern, and modern was about becoming more like the industrialized countries of the West. This is how common people as well as the experts thought. It was believed that every country would go through the process of modernization as in the West, which involved the breakdown of traditional social structures and the rise of capitalism and liberalism. Modernization was also associated with the ideas of growth, material progress and scientific rationality. This kind of idea of development allowed everyone to talk about different countries as developed, developing or underdeveloped. On the eve of independence, India had before it two models of modern development, the liberal capitalist model as in much of Europe and the US and the socialist model as in the USSR. You have already studied these two ideologies and read about their Cold War between the two superpowers. There were many in India then who were deeply impressed by the Soviet model of development. These included not just the leaders of the Communist Party of India, but also those of the Socialist Party and leaders like Nehru within the Congress. There were very few supporters of the American-style capitalist development. This reflected a broad consensus that had developed during the national movement. The nationalist leaders were clear that the economic concerns of the government of free India would have to be different from the narrowly defined commercial functions of the colonial government. It was clear, moreover, that the task of poverty alleviation and social and economic redistribution was being seen primarily as the responsibility of the government. There were debates among them. For some, industrialization seemed to be the preferred path. For others, the development of agriculture and in particular alleviation of rural poverty was the priority. Planning despite the various differences, there was a consensus on one point, that development could not be left to private actors, that there was the need for the government to develop a designer plan for development. In fact the idea of planning as a process of rebuilding economy earned a good deal of public support in the 1940s and 1950s all over the world. The experience of Great Depression in Europe, the interwar reconstruction of Japan and Germany, and most of all the spectacular economic growth against heavy odds in the Soviet Union in the 1930s and 1940s contributed to this consensus. Thus the Planning Commission was not a sudden invention. In fact, it has a very interesting history. We commonly assume that private investors, such as industrialists and big business entrepreneurs, are averse to ideas of planning. They seek an open economy without any state control in the flow of capital. That was not what happened here. Rather, a section of the big industrialists got together in 1944 and drafted a joint proposal for setting up a planned economy in the country. It was called the Bombay Plan. The Bombay Plan wanted the state to take major initiatives in industrial and other economic investments. Thus, from left to right, planning for development was the most obvious choice for the country after independence. Soon after India became independent, the Planning Commission came into being. The Prime Minister was its chairperson. It became the most influential and central machinery for deciding what path and strategy India would adopt for its development. Planning Commission Do you recall any reference to the Planning Commission in your book Constitution at Work last year? Actually there was none, for the Planning Commission is not one of the many commissions and other bodies set up by the Constitution. 
The Planning Commission was set up in March 1950 by a simple resolution of the Government of India. It has an advisory role and its recommendations become effective only when the Union Cabinet approved these. The resolution which set up the Commission defined the scope of its work in the following terms. The Constitution of India has guaranteed certain fundamental rights to the citizens of India and enunciated certain directive principles of state policy, in particular, that the state shall strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting a social order in which justice, social, economic and political, shall direct its policy towards securing, among other things, uh, that the citizens, men and women equally, have the right to an adequate means of livelihood, b, that the ownership and control of the material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good, and c, that the operation of the economic system does not result in the concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment. The early initiatives As in the USSR, the Planning Commission of India opted for five-year plans, FYP. The idea is very simple, the government of India prepares a document that has a plan for all its income and expenditure for the next five years. Accordingly the budget of the central and all the state governments is divided into two parts, non-plan, budget that is spent on routine items on a yearly basis and, plan, budget that is spent on a five-year basis as per the priorities fixed by the plan. A five-year plan has the advantage of permitting the government to focus on the larger picture and make long-term intervention in the economy. My agricultural sector was hit hardest by partition and needed urgent attention. Huge allocations were made for larger scale projects like the Bakran Angle Dam. The plan identified the pattern of land distribution in the country as the principal obstacle in the way of agricultural growth. It focused on land reforms as the key to the counterist development. One of the basic aims of the planners was to raise the level of national income, which could be possible only if the people saved more money than they spent. As the basic level of spending was very low in the 1950s, it could not be reduced any more. So the planners sought to push savings up. That too was difficult as the total capital stock in the country was rather low compared to the total number of employable people. Nevertheless, people's savings did rise in the first phase of the planned process until the end of the third five-year plan. But, the rise was not as spectacular as was expected at the beginning of the first plan. Later, from the early 1960s till the early 1970s, the proportion of savings in the country actually dropped consistently. Rapid industrialization The second FYP stressed on heavy industries. It was drafted by a team of economists and planners under the leadership of P. C. Mahalanobish. If the first plan had preached patience, the second wanted to bring about quick structural transformation by making changes simultaneously in all possible directions. Before this plan was finalized, the Congress party at its session held at Avedi near the then Madras city, passed an important resolution. It declared that socialist pattern of society was its goal. This was reflected in the second plan. The government imposed substantial tariffs on imports in order to protect domestic industries. Such protected environment helped both public and private sector industries to grow. As savings and investment were growing in this period, a bulk of these industries like electricity, railways, steel, machineries and communication could be developed in the public sector. Indeed, such a push for industrialization marked a turning point in India's development. It, however, had its problems as well. 
India was technologically backward, so it had to spend precious foreign exchange to buy technology from the global market. That apart, as industry attracted more investment than agriculture, the possibility of food shortage loomed large. The Indian planners found balancing industry and agriculture really difficult. The third plan was not significantly different from the second. Critics pointed out that the planned strategies from this time around displayed an unmistakable urban bias. Others thought that industry was wrongly given priority over agriculture. There were also those who wanted focus on agriculture-related industries rather than heavy ones. Key controversies the strategy of development followed in the early years raised several important questions. Let us examine two of these disputes that continue to be relevant.